to those who have never been called to prove the faithfulness of the covenant-keeping God, it might seem a hazardous experiment to send 24 European evangelists to a distant heathen land with only God to look to. But in one whose privileges it has been through many years to put that God to the test at home and abroad, by land and sea, in sickness and in health, in dangers, necessities, and at the gates of death, such apprehensions would be holy and excusable. The year is 1865. The fact that there would be no set salaries made Hudson's mission distinctive enough, but he also opened its membership to volunteers from any denomination. He explained his thinking about the mission's makeup and organization this way. We had to consider whether it would not be possible for members of various denominations to work together on simple evangelistic lines without friction as to conscientious differences of opinion. Prayerfully concluding that it would, we decided to invite the cooperation of fellow believers, irrespective of denominational views, who fully held the inspiration of God's word and were willing to prove their faith by going to inland China with only the guarantee they carried in their Bibles. That the word said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If anyone did not believe that God spoke the truth, it would be better for him not to go to China to propagate the faith. If he did believe it, surely the promise sufficed. Again we have the assurance, No good thing will be held or withheld from them that walk uprightly. If anyone did not mean to walk uprightly, he'd better stay at home. If he did mean to walk uprightly, he had all he needed in the shape of a guarantee fund. God owns all the gold and silver in the world and the cattle on a thousand hills. We need not be vegetarians. We might indeed have had a guarantee fund if we had wished it, but we felt that it was unnecessary and would do harm. Money wrongfully placed and money given from wrong motives are both greatly to be dreaded. We can afford to have as little as the Lord chooses to give, but we can af cannot afford to have unconsecrated money or to have money placed in the wrong position. Far better have no money even to buy bread with. There are plenty of ravens in China, and the Lord could send them again with bread and flesh. He sustained three million Israelites in the wilderness for forty years. We do not expect him to send three million missionaries to China, but if he did, he would have ample means to sustain them all. Let us see that we keep God before our eyes, that we walk in His ways and seek to please and glorify Him in everything great and small. Depend upon it. God's work, done in God's way, will never lack God's supplies. That declaration of faith, combined with the size of the task Hudson and his fledgling mission were taking on, drew the notice of Britain's Christian community. A lot of those who first heard the plans of this brash, unknown young missionary didn't quite know what to make of him. <clears throat> but Hudson wasn't as concerned about his own countrymen's opinions of him as he was about the respect of the Chinese people. For that reason, he persuaded the leaders of the Perth Conference to give him a chance to address the assembly. Now, the Perth Conference was an annual meeting of 2,000 ministers and Christian leaders from all over Scotland. He began his address by transporting his audience halfway around the world, vividly recounting a true story of a journey he made in October 1865 from Shanghai to Ningpo aboard a Chinese junk. Among his fellow passengers had been a Chinese man who was educated in England and went by the name of Peter. As Hudson talked with him, he learned that while the man knew the teachings of Christianity, he had never made a personal commitment to Christ. As Hudson and Peter began developing a friendship on this journey, Hudson had opportunity to talk to the man about his spiritual needs. As the junk approached the city of Sunyang, Hudson was in his cabin preparing to go ashore to preach and distribute tracts when he heard a splash and then a cry of alarm that a man had fallen overboard. Rushing onto the deck, Hudson didn't see his new friend Peter. Was he the missing man? Yes, the boatman told Hudson, showing no concern. He went down over there. After convincing the reluctant captain to drop his sails, 
Hudson jumped over the side and began swimming back to the spot where Peter had disappeared. But the tide was running out, and the low, shrubless shore provided no good landmark. His search seemed hopeless. Just then Hudson spotted some nearby fishermen with a dragnet, just what he needed. Come, he cried out in Chinese. Come and drag over here. A man is drowning. They been? The fisherman replied. It is not convenient. Come quickly, or it will be too late, Hudson pleaded. We are busy fishing. Never mind your fishing. Come at once, and I will pay you well. How much will you give us? The fisherman wanted to know. Five dollars, but hurry. Too little, they called back. We won't come for less than thirty. Hudson told them, I don't have that much with me, but I'll give you all I have. How much is that? They asked. I don't know. About fourteen dollars? They finally brought their net over, and the first time that they passed it through the water, they dragged up the missing man. But all Hudson's efforts to revive Peter failed. It was too late. The fisherman's indifference had cost him his life. At the conclusion of that story, a murmur of indignation swept over the crowd listening to Hudson. How could anyone be so callous and selfish? That was the moment Hudson drove home his point. Is the body then of so much more value than the soul? We condemn those healthy fishermen. We say they were guilty of the man's death because they easily could have saved him and did not do it. But what of the millions whom we leave to perish, and that eternally? What of the plain command, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Hudson went on to describe the incredible spiritual need of China. He compared Scotland with its population of four million people and thousands of ministers to China with its 400 million people and only 91 missionaries, less than one missionary for every four million people. He explained how in the interior of China that there were regions as big as all Europe without a single minister of the gospel. He went on to tell his audience, It will not do to say that you have no special call to go to China. With these facts before you, you need rather to ascertain whether you have a special call to stay home. If in the sight of God you cannot say you are sure that you have a special call to stay at home, why are you disobeying the Savior's plan and his command to go? Why are you refusing to come to the help of the Lord again of the Almighty? If, however, it is perfectly clear that duty, not inclination, not pleasure, not business, detains you at home, are you laboring in prayer for those needy ones as you might? Is your influence used to advance the cause of God among them? Are your means as largely employed as they should be in helping forward their salvation? At that point, Hudson went on to recount that painful con conversation with his Ningpo Christian friend, Mr. Ni, nee, when the ex-Buddhist teacher had asked, How long have you had the glad tidings in your country? Hudson had to admit, Some hundreds of years now. And now he told that assembly of Christian leaders about Mr. Ni's nee's pointed response. Hundreds of years, and you have never come to tell us? My father sought the truth and died without finding it. Oh, why did you not come sooner? Hudson continued his address to the Perth gathering. Shall we say that the way was not open? At any rate, it is open now. Before the next Perth conference, twelve million more in China will have passed forward beyond our reach. What are we doing to bring them tidings of redeeming love? The Lord commands us, commands us each one individually, Go, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Will you say to him, it is not convenient? Will you tell him you are busy fishing, have bought a piece of land, purchased five yoke of oxen, married a wife, or for other reasons cannot obey? Will he accept such excuses? Have you forgotten that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in the body? Oh, remember... Pray for, labor for the unevangelized millions of China, or you will sin against your own soul. Consider again whose word it is that says, If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn into death, and them that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, 
doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall he render to every man according to his works? With that challenge, Hudson ended his address. So powerful were his words and the conviction behind them that the great meeting was dismissed almost in silence. Who was this man who had such vision and faith? Soon Hudson was being invited to speak in churches and all at all meetings all over Great Britain, and the people who heard his passion and vision for China responded to his message. One thing, however, still troubled Hudson. He was concerned that his new mission might in some way deflect men or money from existing agencies. He felt that robbing Peter to pay Paul would do nothing to advance the kingdom of God. So he established standards that allowed the China Inland Mission to accept workers who might not be accepted by other missions, particularly those who hadn't completed university training. And furthermore, no one would be recruited or asked to join the mission. He believed that God would prompt those whom he wanted to volunteer. In the same way, there would be no appeals for money. Hudson trusted that if the mission could be sustained in answer to prayer without donor lists or solicitation of any kind, it might grow up among the older societies without danger of diverting gifts from established channels. He believed the policy might even be helpful as an example to others that God would provide for those who obeyed him. There wasn't much to the China Inland Mission in the way of formal organization. Hudson's longtime friends and supporters, Mr. and Mrs. Berger of St. Hill, played an essential role, which Hudson later explained by writing, When I decided to go forward, Mr. Berger undertook to represent us at home. The thing grew up gradually. Neither of us asked or appointed the other. It was just so. A few essential spiritual principles were discussed with the candidates so that each principle was clearly understood as the basis of the mission. A few simple arrangements were agreed to in writing in Mr. Berger's presence, and that was all. Again, Hudson wrote, We came out as God's children at God's command to do God's work, depending upon him for supplies, to wear native dress, and to go inland. I was to be the leader in China. There was no question as to who was to determine points at issue. Just as Hudson was to be in charge of the mission in China, Mr. Berger was responsible at home. He would correspond with the candidates, receive and forward the contributions, publish a regular report and accounting of the work and its finances in what was to be called an occasional paper. Mr. Berger would also send out suitable reinforcements as funds permitted and keep clear of debt. This last point was a cardinal principle Hudson felt strongly about. As he explained, it is really just as easy for God to give beforehand, and he much prefers to do so. He is too wise to allow his purposes to be frustrated for lack of a little money, but money obtained in unspiritual ways is sure to hinder the blessing. Nothing seemed to be hindering Hudson's plans for the new mission that fall. A number of candidates had been accepted, had moved to London, were being trained in the suddenly crowded Taylor home on Coburn Street. When the house next door promptly became vacant, the mission rented it, and accommodations were doubled. A letter Hudson wrote his mother in November spells out the level of activity going on at the time. The revision is now going on. We have reprinted the pamphlet again and have missionary boxes on the way. I am preparing a magazine for the mission, furnishing a house completely, setting up two fonts of type for China, teaching four pupils Chinese, receiving applications from candidates, and lecturing or attending meetings continually. One night only accepted for the last month. I am also preparing a New Year's address on China for use in Sunday schools and a missionary map of the whole country. Join us in praying for funds and for the right kind of laborers also that others might be kept back or not accepted for many are offering. Prayers were being answered. Candidates for all 24 positions were accepted. And by the time the first occasional paper telling of plans and upcoming expresses for the voyage to China came off the press, the money was in hand. An insert had to be put in all the papers saying that the current needs of the mission had all been met. In the early months of 1866, the last prayer meetings were held in the Taylor House on Coburn Street, 